Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our lecture tonight. Today, <laughs> it's tonight where I am. Um, titled the following the evidence to Bob in the R. We just wait another minute uh, for everyone to join. And I will be introducing Dr. Martin Dean. Um, and at the end, we're going to have um, um, time for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions in Q&A box and we'll read them at the end. Uh, I see that people are still joining, so just another minute. Okay, um, I see. I, I think I think this is it, and I'm very happy to welcome everybody to tonight's lecture. Professor Martin Dean will be speaking about his experience with the evidence of the Babi Yar massacre in Kiev. Um, Professor Dean received a PhD in European history from Queen's College in Cambridge. He has worked as a researcher for the Special Investigations Unit in Sydney, Australia, and as a senior historian for the Metropolitan Police War Crimes Unit in London. As a research staff at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, Professor Dean um, was a volume editor for the Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos, and his publications include Collaboration in the Holocaust and uh, Robbing the Jews, which won the National Jewish Book Award in 2009. He is based in Washington, D.C., and works as a historical researcher for the Babin Yard Holocaust Memorial Center, and is an adjunct professor teaching courses on Holocaust studies and World War II at King University in New Jersey. His ongoing research project is an analysis of Babin Yar massacre, combining aerial photography, ground photographs, and witness testimony. So welcome, Professor Dean. This is, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Olga. It's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you to NYU for inviting me for this uh, event today. Uh, this year is the 80th anniversary of the uh, Babinya massacre, and I'm sure you will get more information about um, Babinya and, and what's going on in Kiev over the coming year. But I, I want to take you back really to the, the wartime period. And um, I was always um, kind of curious to know more about the, the details of, of where it happened and what happened. So today I'll examine the complex history of the Babinya ravine, where more than 33,000 Jewish men, women, and children were shot by units of the German SS and police in late September 1941. Using evidence consisting of photographs, witness testimonies, and aerial images, I will reconstruct the route taken by the Jews into the ravine and identify the location of the mass shootings. Using a digital 3D model, the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center has reconstructed the historical terrain, which enables us to examine the path of the Jews on their last journey. In particular, by following the trail of discarded property and clothing captured in photographs and described by witnesses, this path can be traced from the city to the site of the shooting. So I'll start with a bit of background. Um, what I'll be covering today roughly is some information on the operations of the Einsatzgruppen, and then obviously on, on the instructions given to the Jews that they were to assemble. We'll look quite in detail at how the property of the Jews was taken away along the route. And um, one of the main aims today will be to examine exactly where the mass shootings took place. Finally, there is the issue of the covering up of the evidence again in 1943 uh, by the Sonder Commander 1005. And we'll look very briefly at some of the memorials at, at the Babinia site. Um, since the um, 1990s at least. 
as most of you probably know, we're aware of the activities of the Einsatzgruppe in the of a series of very detailed reports that were um, prepared by the Einsatzgruppe themselves and, and were captured um, more or less by chance actually in two different locations uh, at the end of the war. So we have detailed records of hundreds of mass shootings which add up to more than a million victims in total. This wasn't the, the whole scale actually of, of mass shootings in the East. There's many of the, the killings by the security police in 1942 and 1943 are not included in that total. Uh, but for 1941, at least it, it, it's fairly comprehensive and it gives the place and date and uh, number of victims for most actions and also describes those victims as Jews. For example, uh, in early October, 1941, there's a report that states that 33,771 Jews were shot at Babignan on September the 29th to the 30th, 1941. And, and most of the research I've done, and especially witness statements by, by some of the, the Germans involved, seems to, to more or less corroborate this number. Around 20,000 or 22,000 were probably shot on the first day, September the 29th. The remainder of another 10 or 11,000 were shot on the, the second day, September the 30th. So it was a very large scale operation involving a number of, of additional police units as well as some of the commander 4A. But we'll look a little bit first at the Einsatzgruppen operations. Um, these were sort of combined task forces of, of various um, police units put together at the start of Operation Barbarossa uh, to follow behind the army and conduct a variety of different security operations, but they, they certainly took a lot, spent a large part of their time rounding up and shooting uh, Jews. And um, initially they dealt mainly with, with male Jews. Later on, they shifted to, to women and children. Uh, among the personnel involved were not only security police investigators and the so-called SD intelligence staff, um, but also administrative personnel. And uh, also a number of drivers. These were mobile units and, and drivers played quite a key role. They were also involved in shootings as were, of course, um, order police and Waffen-S guards assigned to the Einsatzgruppen for these kind of guard duties. Additionally, there were even interpreters as they were interrogating prisoners and ethnic Germans were recruited along the route, um, also providing a number of different functions, including as interpreters and guards. This is an example of a, an early Einsatzgruppen shooting here. They're using rifles. Generally later on, they used machine pistols and, and uh, sometimes other types of machine guns. Um, here you can see that it's been conducted in a trench. The main concern was that the, the bullets didn't ricochet away and that none of the spectators or, or people participating themselves got shot. Um, you can see in the background here, I think this was certainly an early shooting, there's quite a large crowd watching this particular shooting. Um, obviously later on they, they tried to prevent this, but as Father Dubois' work has shown, it was something that, that did tend to attract the curious. And, and so we do have quite a number of different uh, witness testimonies about these mass shootings. So by August of 1941, um, the victim groups had been expanded um, to include women and children. This is a, an image from the mass shooting at, at Kamenetz Podolsk of more than 20,000 Jews by forces of the order police under the command of Pyro SS and police leader uh, Eberhard Jekyll. And this at that time was the largest killing of its type. Uh, it was very similar to the um, massacre at Babiola that followed a few weeks later, and it paved the way for it. Some of the, the same units were involved. The victims included more than 12,000 Jews deemed to be stateless who'd been deported by the Hungarian authorities into German-occupied Ukraine a few weeks earlier. And here you can see Kamenetz Podolsk here to the west as the Germans moved forward. It took them a little longer to capture Kiev. There were also mass shootings conducted by Sonderkam Commando 4A in Zhutomir and Vinitsa, and um, uh, also at Vilitsekov and Vilitsekva. And they arrived in Kiev um, just after the middle of September 1941. And the events in Kiev were, were certainly quite dramatic. Uh, on September the 24th, uh, several large explosions break buildings used by the German military administration along Kiev's main street, the Kreshatik. They were caused and set off by the NKVD, um, so Soviet Social Security Service, killing dozens of people. The resulting fires that burned for a week, together with German contagion, containment measures, caused widespread damage in the city. Um, it obviously took them a while to, to, to put the fires out. The Germans even destroyed some of the buildings around the already existing fires in order to sort of limit the damage, but this increased the destruction inside the city. Here we have an image of the fires burning in Kiev. 
and um, um, following these explosions on September 25th to 27th, the SS and Wehrmacht commanders met in Kiel. They decided upon the murder of the city's Jews, portraying it as a reprisal uh, for the recent explosions. Blackouts calling on all Jews to present themselves to resettlement at a specific road junction near Babiar were posted around the city by the Ukrainian police on September 28th. A threatened punishment for not complying was death. Here you have the details of the um, announcement. It was in three languages, in, in Russian, Ukrainian, and German. Uh, the Jews were, for example, ordered to bring with them documents, money, and valuables, as well as warm clothing, bed clothes. Uh, the implication was that they would probably be resettled but most people were not expecting at this time what, what actually uh, transpired. And um, as a sort of uh, added menace, anyone uh, refusing to obey this uh, requirement um, who was found afterwards was threatened with being shot, as were any local um, Ukrainians or Russians who um, broke into abandoned apartments to try to steal objects. So from the start, the, the Germans were very conscious of the, the looting aspect of their own murder campaign. Of course, the, the Jews who were faced with this, this sudden demand that they report the next morning asked themselves what they would do. Here's an example by Vera Bogutska, who was a teenager at the time. We lived at Tarasivskaya number 8A, apartment 19. We discussed the placards. Most people were of the opinion that we would be sent away to work. My mother packed up our things. I saw that the streets were full of people carrying luggage with them. Some of them one, had one or two wheeled carts. They were all going in one direction. Towards evening, my mother and I left our apartment with our luggage. We went down several streets together with many other people. The collection point was in the vicinity of the Jewish burial grounds. We, we have this testimony as, as Vera was one of the few Jews who managed to escape. She was actually put into a, a holding place overnight, uh, but managed to persuade a German to, to let her go and was able to, to make good her escape. But um, a very few number of Jews um, were lucky to get out of the sort of encirclement once they were trapped there. Here's an image of the, the Jews on their last journey on Earth. This is the inscription on the back of a German uh, soldier's photograph. Here you can see the type of luggage they were bringing with them. A lot of people had bundles. Some even had uh, hired horses and carriages because they had, had so much luggage. Uh, and they were already forming a kind of column um, going towards Babinar. And um, they were directed to go towards the cemeteries, uh, which was an area to the west of the city. Um, using Raoul Hilberg's analysis, we can see that in Kiev, the, the sort of four main stages of the Holocaust were compressed into just a, a short two-day period, effectively. You have the definition, concentration, confiscation, and destruction of Jews, which in Germany took as long as 10 years, was done very quickly in Kiev. First of all, you get the, the poster announcement, uh, which um, requires the, the Jews to present themselves. Then they were marched more or less in a, a large column to Babignal, which gradually closed in on them. The, the Germans um, didn't let anyone out beyond a certain point. Um, their property and clothing was taken along the route, as we'll see in a moment. And then they, they were all shot in the ravine over just two days um, just outside the city. Here we get some information about the first German check, checkpoint. So essentially, the Jews were mostly marching down Melnikov Street. And around Pugachev Street, uh, they came to a, um, basically a, a checkpoint um, beyond which uh, people who um, were accompanying them were known. So the, the non Jewish people who accompanying them were not allowed to, to go any further. Here's an account by Genya Batashova. So we walked a short distance past Pugachev Street, and there on both sides stood anti tank hedgehogs with a passageway down the middle. We could walk to this passageway, we could still move towards this, towards these anti tank hedgehogs we could turn around. And a lot of things were already scattered next to these anti-tank hedgehogs. Farther on, there was nothing. But right in front of this, people were already throwing down such heavy, portable things. And essentially, it was, was um, a kind of point of no return. Quite a bit of luggage was piled up there, as, as Genia mentions. And these, um, these were the anti-tank hedgehogs, which basically meant that certainly vehicles and carts couldn't go any further. So people had to sort of transport in their arms anything they wanted to take uh, a bit further. And this is a little further down the route. We'll, we'll explain the route in a moment from an aerial view. Uh, but this is a, a, a alley of trees. And you can see here all the huge bundles of luggage, the sacks of, of clothing mostly, and, and bedding, which have been put to the side. And here you can see um, the Jews themselves marching in a, in a column um, out towards the, 
um, rest of the city. Germans here already examining their, their documents and telling them to put their balance on the side. And, and from the, the trees and also the view down the alleyway, we start to get an idea where, where this photograph was taken. That's partly how this research has been done by, by using um, already known photographs and trying to locate exactly where they were taken. Um, and the witness descriptions very much confirm what you see in the photographs. This is actually by a member of Commander Commander 4A, Ryana Pushta. He says, I drove outside of Kiev and came to a sort of alley. There stood a checkpoint which let me through. I saw that along this alley, which was about two kilometers long, Jews were marching. They were going in groups as if for a stroll. On the left lay an enormous amount of luggage. The area of the pile on which the luggage lay was about three meters wide. The pile was two meters high. It looked like a very high pile of potatoes. The Jews threw their luggage onto this pile, I assume. At the end of the alley, I think on the right, there was an open area. There on the right, there were tables where the registration took place. And again, here we see another view down the alley. You can see the trees here and the piles of luggage. And then probably at the end of the alley, um, up on the, the right, if you're sort of looking backwards, it's, um, you can see here's probably the place where they were being registered and, and their documents were going through. And there's actually piles of documents here in, in the field next to the, the alley of trees. And I think this is probably the luggage in the distance here. So going to um, an aerial view, we can start piecing this together. Uh, this is the, the alley of trees down which they had to march. There's the corner here where they, they turn to the right. And you can see there's a, a building behind here. Um, and we'll see a close-up. If you look down the alley of trees, you can just see a, a window and a building at the end. Um, and on the chart of the same alley, this is the alley of trees, you can see there's a building on the end here. So this is probably roughly the view looking down here. And this, this confirms the route they were taking. This is actually Kahatna Street here. Dorogozhitska Street, here where the Eye of Trees is leading down towards Babin Yard. So, first of all, the, the, the Jews march down Malnikov Street to the checkpoint, um, close to Pugachev Street. They then arrive roughly at the area of the Jewish Cemetery, and that's where they actually turn to the left. So, they, they don't go through the Jewish Cemetery, as some people have speculated before, uh, but turn instead um, left um, down Kahatna Street and then right on Dorogozhitska Street the end of the main ravine. You can see it here on this aerial photo much better. Um, this is um, Melnikov Street coming out of the city here. These are actually a, um, a barracks here which are used to, to hold some of the Jews overnight in at least one of these buildings. Um, most of the time they're going past this up to the Jewish cemetery which starts around here and then they go left on Kahatna Street then right down Dorogoshitska Street and um, this is probably where they, they entered the main ravine here. This is a little bit less clear, but they also come right off here. Some of them are transported by, by truck. It's not quite clear how many, but some of the women children are tra transported by, by truck. And then eventually they come to a, a sand quarry around here. This is um, something that we only confirmed fairly recently uh, by examining again a number of photographs and other sources, especially witness testimonies, and we'll deal with that. And then the actual shooting takes place not in the main ravine here, but in this uh, Western Spur, as we can show you with other details. Here is actually, this is a, a, an aerial image from 1943, so it's a little bit misleading. The actual the Jewish cemetery is more open than it was in, in 39 or 41, when a lot of trees were still here, especially in this part of the Jewish cemetery. And the Siritz camp is not created until 1942. So this is a later photograph. We do have photographs from 1939. The only one from early 41 um, doesn't cover this part of the ravine, unfortunately. So, um, but we do know from the 39 photographs that there was a sand quarry here uh, from 1939. So here you see another. Hey, Dr. Dean, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I just had a couple of requests for you to speak a little bit closer to the microphone, if possible. Sure. Okay. Great, thank you. So here we see the the infamous sand quarry. This is the the famous photo taken by Johannes Haler. These photographs didn't come out really to to public availability till the 1990s or so. And it always caused a lot of speculation. Uh, for a long time, because of the height of the cliffs, I really couldn't figure out where this, this was. So it was, it was quite a big part of my research was just identifying where this, where this photograph was taken, but we're, we're pretty sure we've got it exactly right now. And the, the 3D model confirms things almost exactly. Uh, and here you see, this is where the, the Jews were forced to undress before they go um, probably up into the left-hand corner here. You see the piles of clothing going around to the left. And then the actual shooting ravine is over this cliff uh, and down into the other ravine on the other side.
So most of the Jews were forced to undress in the sand quarry. This is confirmed both by witness statements and also by the halo photographs. They were then driven around to the left to enter the western spur up a slope and through a specially created passageway. A few more may have descended into the main ravine on the right and then down to the left and to enter the western spur in its junction with the main ravine. Again, a close up shows the, 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 just the mass of this clothing and also the, the Germans going through it. Now, the reason why the, the Germans decided to get them to take off their clothing was mainly because they suspected, and, and rightly so, that there was a lot of valuables hidden in the clothing. And initially, they were trying to just sort of search the people as they were going past, and this was taking too long. So they, they asked them to, to speed up and just um, uh, take all their clothes off before they were shot. And, and that was um, fairly common practice with nearly all the, the mass shootings of Jews, whereas with other groups of victims, such as partisans, it was actually very rare for them to be forced to undress beforehand. So here you see a, a sort of constructed a 3D model version of the sand quarry. And we did actually find uh, later images showing all the way around to sort of confirm what it looks like. And here you see how the, the clothing bears around to the left. And here you see the, the, the notch, which is probably the way that the Jews entered into what became the shooting ravine over here. And we have quite a few descriptions by Germans, especially. Um, and uh, one or two survivors that confirm um, this topography. Now, this is the main ravine here, and the main ravine links into the, the Western Spur up here. Um, there are also sketch maps done by the Germans, one of which draws a sort of a pool of blood around here, which probably all came down this, this Western Spur. It may have, may have been some shooting in, in the main ravine, but there's not much evidence of that. So here's another um, witness statement by Alban Pover. So apart from Sonder Commando 4A, there were two police battalions uh, that were quite heavily engaged at Avignon. Police Battalion 45 also provided some shooters. Uh, here he's describing uh, the route taken, uh, Alban Pover. In the afternoon hours, we were brought in the direction of the execution site. It was similar to a sand quarry. Um, since there, before the Jews went into the quarry, a holdup had occurred. We had to ensure that the Jews were sent into the quarry without any delay. We also did this successfully in the ensuing hollow, there were throngs of assembled Jews. And so far as I was able to observe, the Jews had to undress at the end of the quarry, went partly naked, partly in their underclothes, over a steep slope, and disappeared into the adjacent valley or behind a mountain slope. From there, one could hear shooting. So this all corroborates pretty closely um, what we're seeing from the visual evidence. So this is actually the, the silent witness that helped me to, to solve the puzzle, so to speak, um, especially this tree I call the lone tree on the skyline. This is a view taken after the war down the, the main ravine. And here's another one um, also from a, a moving image, which shows you a little piece of the sand quarry here. So this is probably roughly where the girl is sitting. It's this part of the sand quarry here. And uh, actually, Carol Burkop also found other photographs taken uh, of the sand quarry um, just after the mass shooting from a different angle, which sort of show how it, it is, in fact, this piece around here. Uh, you might see the other end of the sand quarry is just this bit hiding here when you look down the western spur. Now you can't see the um, the lone tree here on this this ridge, which is certainly the same ridge. And so it, it's just a question of perspective. If you go um, in detail, here you see again the, the view down the, the main um, ravine with the um, tree on the skyline. And here, you look very closely, this is actually the tree on the skyline. You have to go in into a lot of detail. Now, this photograph was taken uh, probably on October the 1st or possibly a day later. Um, it shows Soviet POWs covering over where most of the shooting um, probably took place. And uh, they're obviously under German supervision. And what actually happened was the Germans blew up the sides of the ravine using explosives, uh, then to sort of flatten it out and make it look um, more acceptable. Uh, they use Soviet POWs, and, and the sort of explosions are probably where you see these more steep sides to the ravine in certain places, possibly over here as well. There's, there's quite fresh earth uncovered. And so uh, before the explosions, probably this whole ravine was, was, was full of corpses, and that's what some people actually describe. Uh, here you see the lone tree sitting on the ridge, uh, seen again from the halo photograph. So this is the different angle, and you can't see it in the, in the photograph because of the trees behind. So literally, you can't see the tree for the woods. Just to confirm the two different views, this is the view down the, 
the main ravine, which has the tree against the skyline because there's nothing really behind it. Whereas if you look down the, the western spur here, uh, you see the tree has got these trees behind it, uh, which kind of um, block its clear visibility on the skyline. So it's this part here with the trees behind. And finally, um, here you see the, the same quarry as it was in 1943 with an enlargement, which is the bit between the, the main ravine and the Western Spur where the Jews were undressing and then forced to go over this ridge. So historians had already um, some knowledge that the Western Spur was used for the shootings. This is a, a, a diagram from 2000. It includes this site as a, a, a shooting site, but it did also include other shooting sites, which we're not really able to corroborate from the evidence I've seen at least. But to my mind, this was the main shooting site on the 29th to the 30th of September 1941. It's only speculative whether they might have also been shooting uh, people more in this area, but it does seem to, to match definitely the descriptions we have. So we have Herman Last, who also drew a sketch map. He describes, now we went from the undressing spot up the small hill to the edge of the ravine. The ravine was about 10 to 12 meters deep. In the ravine were lying tens of thousands of corpses on top of each other. They were all naked. I can re reconstruct the shooting process as follows. On the edge of the ravine stood SD men who formed a chain down to the Jews in the clothing deposit area. The Jews from the clothing deposit area had to go past these SD men. So they go up the slope and then um, from other descriptions, we know the, the Jews are more or less forced down into the bottom of the ravine are made to lie on top of, sometimes the corpses already lying there in a shot from very short range uh, with machine pistols by the men of Sunder Commander 4A, including Duffin SS men and also uh, members of police battalion 45. Here we get a better aerial view of the whole situation, uh, again from the 43 photograph. Um, this is the view you see down the western spur. It bears a little to the right, as described by the witnesses. Here you have the, the sand quarry, and uh, this is the, the notch here where people are marching up over the slope down into the other view. Just another view. So Victor Trill was an important witness uh, for my research as he was a driver. And interestingly, the, the drivers often remember the route they went and, and the sort of the details of the terrain in a bit more detail than some of the other people were sitting in the back of the truck and just get out in a place they've never seen before. And he describes a bridge, which is more or less uh, the place where you see um, Haler standing to take his photograph. So this is not really a bridge, although the, uh, before the war, this ravine did continue the other side of the road. So that may be why um, Trill describes it as a bridge. But this is the view he's describing. Looking from the bridge, the depression made a turn to the right, where behind this curve, a large round depression in the ground was located. It's possible that this comprised a former sand or gravel pit. In this pit, there were also countless people who I can safely assume were all Jews. Also in this pit were mountains of clothing of all sorts. The execution was now starting again. The Jews standing in the pit had to take off all their clothing. They were then driven in groups of 10 or 15 uh, down to the dried up riverbed. So just to reiterate, um, Trill is standing here and he's describing how Jews are leaving their clothes here and then coming up and going down into what he describes as a dried up riverbed. There were at least three different groups of, of um, SS men shooting, uh, policemen, and we don't know exactly where they were, but this is a, um, a kind of possible layout of where they were standing. Certainly some were, I think, in this direction. This berm you see here across the ravine that was created later in 1941, and I think from German witness descriptions, it was mainly aimed to try and stop body parts from washing down lower into the ravine system. So it may be that most of the, the shooting was actually done to the right of this, if that would make the most sense. It's possible that some Jews went down this way and up into the ravine and were shot here. It does make some sense in terms of, of not taking people past other people being shot. So this would keep them in sort of three separate groups and um, splitting up as they go along. Finally, we need to discuss the Siretz camp near Babinia. This wasn't uh, built until 1942. It had a lot of non-Jewish prisoners, but there were some Jews and, and um, partial Jews uh, interned there. And uh, as the Germans were retreating in 1943, uh, they decided um, to cover up the, the traces at Babinia one further time. So a massive effort, part of a large scale operation called Sunder Commander 1005 was made 
around 100 prisoners initially from the Syrian camp were taken into uh, the ravine. Actually, they were housed in a, a bunker in the uh, sand quarry. And from there, they went into the Western Spur and to other sites around Babiya where, where other prisoners had been shot in the period uh, from sort of October 41 to September 43, and actually exhumed probably more than 50,000 corpses over a period of about six weeks. Here we see um, from the aerial photograph, the two bunkers where the um, prisoners from uh, the Syrets camp were housed. This is the larger one, this is the smaller one. The prisoners describe a guard tower opposite to the entrance of the two bunkers. Now this to me looks like the, the shadow of that guard tower. Um, and there was a machine gun based up here. And what happens and, and why we know more about the exhumation is that just on, on the, um, before the very end of the, the mass exhumation process, um, there's a mass escape, especially from the, the main bunker at night, about uh, exactly two years after the actual shooting at Babignan. And so having completed the exhumation work, the, the, the prisoners, um, some of whom are Jewish, know that they're probably going to be shot in the next day or so. So they, they managed by going through the, um, the corpses and finding keys that have been in, in the pockets or um, um, buried with the uh, people in the, the mass grave. Um, they found a key that matched the padlock of the uh, bunker they were in, and they managed to escape at night. Um, the guards do alert um, to the escape only a, a couple of minutes after it starts, so not, not everyone manages to escape cleanly. Uh, only about 15 of them uh, survived to the end of the war, but uh, a number of them do manage to run up um, to the end of Babignan or past the Syrians camp and, and find refuge places, usually mostly to the west of Kiev. Um, I haven't got time to go into that in more detail now, but the important thing is that um, this photograph confirms the, the key role of the, the sand quarry and um, um, the prisoners themselves uh, definitely designate the, um, the Western Spur as the place where most of the ex exhumation work was done. Here we see one of those prisoners um, after the war, he points to the um, Western Spur and here in the distance you can see that same ridge um, and the, the trees. And so he's clearly indicating the Western Spur as the place where um, the Jews of, Babin, of Kiev were, were buried and, and where the exhumations also took place. Just very quickly, obviously more very famous is Yevtushenko's um, poem, which comments that no monument stands over Babiya. Babiya. And this um, reflects the Soviet policy of, of trying to uh, limit or cover up knowledge about the, especially the Jewish nature of the victims of Babiya. Eventually in the 70s, uh, a Soviet memorial is put there, um, but it's not really until the 1990s that you get um, much more um, proper and respectful uh, memorials put up. This is the memorial to the Jewish victims at Babiya, which you can now see in Kiev. And there's also uh, a memorial to the Roma victims, um, which was put up um, after 2000. So to give a chance for questions, um, we'll end the lecture there. And I'll have a look in the chat to see what we've got. Thank you so much, Professor Dean, uh, for, the, for the fascinating lecture. Um, I would like to ask you, how do you assess the ongoing creation of the museum in Babin Yar? And uh, what do you think are the major challenges that, that uh, lie be before, you know, be before the museum can be completed and effective? And how do you believe they might be overcome? Well, there, there are many challenges and, and that's quite normal if you look at all the, these big memorials, whether it was the uh, the one in, in Germany or even the Holocaust Museum in, in, in Washington, it wasn't built in a day. It takes about 20 years for these processes to, to work out. I would say that, I mean, there had been efforts in the early 2000s, which mostly stumbled. Uh, the good um, situation at the moment is you have quite strong support from the current Ukrainian government. So I think that does behove one to try and complete this uh, a little more rapidly than one would perhaps like, just to make sure that 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 government support remains in place and we don't quite know how long that will last. So that, that's one cause for urgency, but the, the funding is also to some extent in place and there seems to be a, a greater degree of willpower than before. But of course, there, there are many debates still to be had about exactly the best way to memorialize this. We, we're seeing new um, projects being proposed. Um, some of them look very interesting and certainly a lot of people have been consulted 
but I think it will be a couple more years before we can say for sure exactly what the playing will look like. What, what I'm quite pleased with is that they're now incorporating the whole area around um, uh, the site of Babinyar. So there, there is a huge park and it's been a national park for quite a long time. So this is all being included in the planning for the actual memorial. And people are trying to, to be respectful as they can of the different victims there. There are various victim groups, not just Jewish victims. So it will be a complex memorial with, with many different conflicting interests. And I'm sure a lot of interesting debates still to come. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, uh, yes, let's let's see uh, what uh, uh, Mark Bernstein is asking. Why did the Hala photos only became available in the 90s? Were most of the photos taken by the German soldiers at their own initiative, or was there an official military system of visual documentation? Were the photos taken by the local citizens? Right. Well, nearly all the photos I've been using have been taken by. Um, the Germans, and literally even the aerial photographs were taken by the Germans. Um, in the case of the ones, uh, the Halo photos, for example, um, it's not completely clear why he took those photographs. Um, he was with a propaganda company, but it seems that he was just going for a walk that day and decided to follow this, this trail of interesting things. And we've now been able to locate virtually every photograph that he took. In that sense, we can really retrace his steps. I think the, these photographs were available to some extent to, to German investigators. But like most investigative material, it was kept by the prosecutors and sort of under lock and key until the 1990s. And it wasn't really until the um, Hamburg Institute for Social Forschung did a big project on the, the war in the East and the Holocaust and, and uh, really made these photographs public. But even at that stage, people didn't know exactly where they were taken. So that's been kind of the challenge I've been faced with is trying to locate those photographs. Some of the other photographs were taken by police battalion members. Again, I think this wasn't any kind of official documentation. These were private individuals essentially disobeying orders because I think as early as August 41, there were strict instructions that, that people were not to take photographs of massacres. And although they continued to do this, the official policy was obviously to, to, to confiscate any they, they got wind of. So again, these photographs have only really um, come out fairly recently um, from private ownership. So that's been one of the reasons we've not been able to tell this, this story so fully before. There, there may have been photographs taken by, by local um, people. I've not seen very many. Even the one that I got from Stefan Maskevich, which is of the, the carts on the street uh, in Kiev. Um, that one was, I think he purchased it on the internet and was sort of able to identify at least that it was from Kiev. Um, but again, um, there, there was no a real attempt to, to document this by the Germans. They obviously wanted to keep it as secret as possible. Another question is about the involvement of the military in the actual shooting. So from, from the evidence that I've seen, which mainly consists of a very large scale German investigation, plus of course the photographs and some, some Soviet witness testimonies, the, the German military was definitely aware of, gave permission for and, and partly organized the shooting but they weren't directly involved in, in shooting people in the ravine, as far as I can tell. There were some German military people present to some extent. The SS also wanted to keep them a bit at arm's length, um, but they definitely gave permission and, and were uh, quite instrumental in, in sort of the uh, initial organization of it. Certainly the uh, placards, for example, were uh, organized by a propaganda company under the control of the Wehrmacht and not the SS. So it was a combined uh, operation of the of Wehrmacht and the, the SS, but the um, the Einsatzgruppen was the main group in charge of actually organizing the, the shooting. This is a good question. What did the Germans do with the booty? Um, I can answer this question. I didn't put it in my set of slides that I took, spoke about this recently. I do have one document uh, from Kiev uh, dated 10th of October 1941 by Sonder Commander 4A, which lists hundreds of, of wristwatches and brooches and other jewelry and, and uh, valuable gold items, including rings. I don't think it's everything that they managed to, to get at Babiar. I think partly because there were different units involved, there were different channels of um, uh, communication and, and different um, batches of material were sent to Berlin. This particular letter was addressed to the War Booty Office of the Reichsbank in Berlin and was uh, among several um, Einsatzgruppen uh, caches of, of captured um, valuables that were sent to Berlin. Only the most valuable materials, so gold and silver or something of, of really high value, maybe stocks and shares, were sent to Berlin. Most of the, the clothing, of course, was uh, kept in Kiev um, in warehouses and then distributed uh, to members of the, the local population, especially to ethnic Germans. 
That's something that was sold to, to members of the local population. I also did a, um, a short article on, on the uh, Jewish property in Kiev. Some of the furniture, for example, was then, um, they issued an order that it belonged to the Germans and even uh, where people had acquired it by moving into apartments, they were still uh, made to pay a small sum in order to keep it. So uh, the Germans did make a profit out of the, of the property and they didn't want it to be looted. Of course, there was widespread looting also by German soldiers. So it's not just that everything went into official channels, but the, the aim of the German orders was to keep control of the property themselves for the German state. So um, I should have explained that in more detail. It is an interesting story. The bodies that were exhumed in 1943 were all burned on large funeral pyres with as many as a thousand uh, corpses on, on each pyre. It was, of course, a very disgusting uh, process because they'd been buried in the ground for two years and uh, were, were sort of decomposing. They used hooks and even uh, mechanical diggers to get the bodies out. Uh, and how they burned them was that they took the matseva, the tombstones from the Jewish cemetery, uh, smashed them into pieces and then used those to build the funeral pyres together with uh, iron railings and also probably wood that they got um, perhaps from the Jewish cemetery. It's not quite clear where the, the wood came from. They poured gasoline over it um, to burn it all. And the, the smoke from these burning pyres was visible from Kiev for several days. Initially, the, the fire brigade came out to see what was going on. So it's another example how the very effort to sort of cover up the massacre only provides further evidence for historians that it actually took place. So I don't think there's much, much danger really of Holocaust denial when you look at all the evidence, which uh, is over a period of years from multiple different sources. Um, and the, there are descriptions of how the corpses were unearthed. Uh, there was much as, um, I think four to six meters under the earth, which again seems to confirm this um, idea that they were buried by explosions. There's only one eyewitness testimony who said that he actually saw the explosions, but there are other testimonies of people going there to, to look at the, um, the ground to prepare for the explosions. And then the, the information that explosions are taking place uh, is found in, in a number of different um, secondhand testimonies of people who were told this when they were in Kiev. So there was a question there about why did the Germans go through great pains to hide executions from the public in the West, but not in the East? Did they think citizens in the East were more accepting of them? So I, I do think that's a good question. Um, certainly in the East, um, it was much harder to keep it secret. And there, there were some efforts to do it a certain distance outside the, the town in most cases and to, to have a cordon to keep people away. But it was almost always within earshot and uh, people had seen the Jews marching out past the railway station as it was in this case. It was quite clear that they, they weren't being deported anywhere. And when they hear the shooting shortly afterwards, it was quite clear what had happened. So it was partly just impossible to keep it more secret. I think that there was more local participation in different ways. Um, although most of the actual shooting in, in many executions was done by the SS, there would then be um, follow-up measures where they were looking for Jews in hiding, especially in, in Western Ukraine, where the local police would be uh, heavily involved in that kind of procedure. They also would often be used as cordon guards. You see at, at Babinyar there are um, local police units involved there. It seems mostly that they were used to help to sort of beat the Jews in the direction of where the shooting was taking place and, and maybe force them to undress. Uh, I've not seen clear evidence that they actually did the shooting, although it's possible. And, and obviously afterwards, um, Ukrainian police units were involved in searching for Jews and handing them over to the Germans in that period. And there were rewards given for the handing over of Jews. So Ukrainians do become involved in Kiev afterwards. I think at this stage, the Germans did actually have enough manpower to do most of the shooting themselves. So that, that's the, the information that I'm seeing from the evidence there. Are the records of the names of the victims and survivors? If so, how can they be searched? This is an absolutely excellent question. Um, one of the main tasks of the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center now is to sort of centralize all the information we have in one database, also eliminating duplicates. They're working closely with Yad Vashem on that task. I think they've certainly increased the number of names we have, I think from um, at least 5,000 to, to more than 8,000, possibly even as many as 18,000, although that may of course include the, the duplicates. There are huge problems with this though. We, we never know for sure who was sent to Babinyar and who managed to escape and, and, and maybe was killed somewhere else. Um, so it would take a, a really majestic effort um, to try and put together all the possible archives where you could look for this. You could go looking, for example, in the records 
of Jews who were evacuated from Kiev to, to places further east, see who was on those evacuations, and then sort of deduct that from the pool of people living in Kiev before. What they're doing now, which is very important, is going through the Kiev archives uh, in as much detail as they can, looking for things like um, birth certificates, marriage certificates from the period of the 20s and 30s, and therefore trying to expand the pool of names that way. But of course, with, without some kind of clear evidence that these people are actually on Babbling out the day, that there will be some, some question marks about the ultimate fate. So it may be best to, to classify a lot of these people as war victims, as we, we won't know for sure. There, there was no register used by the, the Germans either before, during, or after this massacre. So unlike the deportation list we have for, for Central and, and Western Europe, uh, it's a bit more like Poland where, um, I mean, the only detailed lists you have are sometimes the welfare records of the Jewish social self-help for particular ghettos. That sometimes lists the number of people who were in ghettos in a certain period of time. Similarly for Kiev, we have pre-war and even some um, Soviet wartime records for individuals living in Kiev, um, but it's always much harder to determine if someone was, was actually uh, on the road to Babinyar or if they were captured a few weeks or months later on, or, or some were even deported um, to, to Germany as forced laborers and may have survived the war that way, but never returned to Kiev. So it, it might be useful to try and compare what we know about uh, survivors from Kiev with these uh, original lists and also the fate of others who died in the war. Um, I got that question from Norbert Weisberg, whether Babino you know, was part of a wider plan to exterminate Jews. I think um, it's a good question. I'm certain that it was part of the wider plan to exterminate Jews and the, the mass extermination had started before that. You have places that are visited just before um, Kiev where all the Jews are killed, um, particularly Bialatserkov, but also in Fastiv, very close to, to Kiev. So there was no doubt that the SS planned to do it. I think it's just that the, the explosions in Kiev gave the army a good excuse to do it. And also they gave them another urgent need was that there was a shortage of accommodation for both the Germans and the local population. So by evacuating the Jews, they made um, space available in the city for themselves to use. So um, it's, a, it's actually a case of both. There was the, the mass murder plan of Hitler, which had already started in, in July and August. Uh, and then the local circumstances um, probably caused this to be accelerated com compared to most other Ukrainian cities. Um, and a number of places, Ghettos were established, for example, in Nikolaev, a ghetto was established around this time. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, after the ghetto was set up, the Jews were killed. So they skipped the ghettoization phase in Kiev and went straight um, to, to the mass shooting, partly because this, this ruse of getting people to appear with their, their property and, and march in a certain direction uh, actually was effective there. I think this became less effective once it was known as a tactic. So you do get a ghetto established in Kharkiv, for example, and a slightly different procedure there. So it, it's actually fairly uncommon for the Germans to, to arrive in a place and shoot all the Jews within about 10 days as happened in Kiev. In most places, they tended to set up ghettos and take a little bit more time to make sure they got everybody, partly because they were um, aware that there might be some resistance or some, some difficulties, or they might want to be getting hold of the property in a different way. But um, it was definitely very accelerated in Kiev compared to most other places. This is a good question. Were any of the SD leadership present there? I think the highest person was um, Eberhard Yekel, although Himmler does visit Kiev fairly soon afterwards. Um, and obviously the, the leaders of the Einsatzgruppen were there. But I, I don't have any, um, any more detailed records about that. I think it is important to, to see what Yekel's role was because he also plays a, a very key role in, Ye in Riga shortly afterwards using very similar techniques. So I think a comparison of the mass shooting in Riga with that in, in Kiev um, would also be a, a useful exercise. So we're getting a lot of questions here. I'm trying to keep up with them. <laughs> Um, the next question I've got here, were the Jews taken for the massacre at Babia just from Kiev proper? I think it was supposed to also incorporate the suburbs of Kiev, and there were some Jews taken to Babinya actually a, a day before the mass shooting started, uh, including prisoners of war who were held at a, a camp at Kerasinaya Street. So it did include uh, some POWs who were shot um, in and around Babia just before the mass shootings in, in the Western Spur. And also um, Jews from the surroundings of Kiev were brought in, but probably only 
maybe five or 10 kilometers at the, at the most. There were um, obviously quite a number of Jews who did manage to escape. Um, there were certainly a lot of Jews in Kiev and not all of them were around it, were, were, were got at that time. They did do house to house searches, trying to find more Jews on the sort of evening of the first day into the second day. So there was definitely a, a big attempt to, to get those who, who evaded it and also in the, the following weeks. So the number of Jews who, who survived in Kiev was, was relatively small, probably um, not more than a few hundred or, or a couple of thousand at the most. But if, obviously a lot had been evacuated before, so we don't have pre precise numbers for, for how many Jews were in Kiev when the Germans arrived in mid-September because of the large-scale evacuations. This is a, another good uh, question. Was there any resistance? There are some individual uh, examples of resistance. Uh, for example, one woman ran to the Jewish cemetery carrying a child and managed to escape and hide there. Um, the, at least one German was attacked by uh, Jews. Mostly, of course, these were women and children or, or people who'd been um, really intimidated and, and beaten on the way to Babinyar, so there, there wasn't much opportunity for resistance. Uh, the most resistance we see are people trying to escape or hide. Uh, there's, there's not obviously uh, much chance of, of large-scale physical resistance at this, at this stage. Um, none of the Jews had weapons, as far as I know, although very few had even a knife that they could use. And so it um, doesn't seem to have been a, a large scale thing, but it's important to record uh, quite the several examples that I've seen. Also, quite a few Jews pretended to be Russians, would go up to German soldiers, and one or two of them were fortunate and were allowed out. Uh, against that, some of the Russians who were trapped in the encirclement were also shot with the Jews. Uh, an officer came at the end of the day. This is described by Dina Konicheva. And um, the people claiming to be Russians, as well as the actual Russians, uh, were shot at the end of the evening uh, on the first day as well. Talk to me, how did you survive from Babinyar shooting and survive to the end of the war? Probably have a number of about 30 or 40. It may even be more than that. Um, it's not a huge number, but uh, quite a few, especially from the evening on the first day, uh, fell into the, the, they were being shot at the edge of the ravine at that time, which was not the normal procedure. So some of them were able to dive into the pile of bodies without being hit, hide until the nightfall and then crawl out. So we do have several accounts of, of mostly women and children who crawled out and, and did manage to hide and survive, including that of Dina Pranichova, of course, but there are several others like that. Professor Dean, thank you so much. I think uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay, I and I would like on. to use my position to ask another one. Okay. Um, okay. How do you think um, the type of research that involves visualization and 3D modeling that allows us to establish more precise location of the mass shootings in this particular case and maybe in other cases, what would it help us in terms of memorialization? Maybe because the, the site in, of Babi Yar is today in the center of Kiev. And even though some memorials are present, it's still problematic that some parts of it are the city space. How do you think it could help it could benefit this type of problem? Well, obviously, the, the more information we have, the, the, the better it is, because there, there is the concern to keep this as a sacred site. That there's a problem at Babinyar that a road and even buildings have been built probably in part of where the shooting took place. So that, that may be very difficult to reverse, or, but it's still important to acknowledge it and to, to try and get things right. So, and just understanding that the complex history of this, this site, uh, one important thing perhaps I should stress is that the, the sand quarry itself only came into existence uh, in the late 30s, 1938 or 39, and then was erased again in 1950 or so. So the place where a lot of the events took place is not even on nearly all of the maps and is only sort of recorded in these photographs by Johannes Haler. So just to be able to, to visualize that and understand uh, the process that took place uh, would, would not be possible without this type of very detailed research. And then there are other sites that have very similar problems. I looked at Panari briefly recently, and some very good research has been done there, which has the same problem that um, the, the site as it is now doesn't reflect the full extent of where shootings took place, and therefore the memorialization is, is to some extent distorted, and people may be just walking calmly over places where shootings took place without really realizing it. So as you say, it's very important to, to do all we can to document this carefully. And it's a combination of, of different approaches that, that seems to be most successful, where you witness testimonies together with photographs, 
aerial photographs and also maps. Maps are very important. But one thing that surprised me is some of the maps were themselves part of the problem. They sort of misled historians to, to make false conclusions because uh, they didn't necessarily update as ter the terrain itself changed over time. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for this amazing lecture and thank you everybody who came uh, to listen. Uh, we were very glad to host this event and we were inviting everybody for the next editions. Thank you so much. Good, good uh, evening, <laughs> good night. Thank you all for listening, uh, goodbye. <laughs>